Well, here we are at the IoT World AI Summit, Austin, Texas. I'm happy to say I've got Alberto Prado, head of R&D, digital partnerships at Unilever. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chuck. So you're, you're presenting here tomorrow. Tell me what you're going to be talking about. I am actually. I'm presenting tomorrow how Unilever is using AI data and high performance computing to reinvent how we create innovation in R&D. So you, and you scale it. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we started already uh, piloting certain things many, many years ago, uh, not alone with partners, uh, because you have to enter a bit of a discovery journey to try and understand uh, the impact that it could have before you decide to scale. Uh, scaling is a transformational journey as well, because you need to change a lot of the ways of working, you need to bring in an upskill, you need to bring in new skills and, and train people. But we're very much uh, in, uh, in a mature state. I mean, it's a journey, it's a long journey, but I would say that you know, the instances in which we uh, leverage AI across the entire R&D spectrum is, is quite uh, mature at this point. And, and what about uh, performance computing in your, your supply chain, where does that fit? High performance computing in yeah. supply chain. So we do work a lot with supply chain. I'll tell you uh, in a, the areas that we work in uh, mm -hmm. and, and the role of high performance computing in that space. So when it comes, once you have a, a product specification in place, you know you've done your, uh, in a, uh, you, you've done your science. You figure out a, a, a new principle of conveying value to consumers, and you have a product specification that needs to be manufactured, right? So we team up with supply chain very closely to simulate how that product can be manufactured at no waste and net zero impact, right? So this is, this is crucial because in most companies, the manufacturing footprint is very varied, it's very mixed, yet the quality of the product needs to be super consistent, right? So we do a lot of um, uh, computational flow uh, diagrams, uh, processing flow simulations to, to understand what is the best way of manufacturing the product, given uh, a complex manufacturing footprint, and given the fact that these products require uh, quite an extensive and, and complex manufacturing process. And for that, we use a lot of high performance computing, of course, because you're dealing with an enormous amount of data, data coming from pilot plants, from factories, and you need to factor that into the whole mix to make sure that once you've decided what product you want to manufacture and how do you want it manufactured, you can send all those instructions almost seamlessly into the controllers of the factories and, and ramp up uh, manufacturing at scale. So are you using digital twins for any of that? Yes, I mean, uh, we use that in the supply chain side of our, of our, of our business. Uh, digital twins, I mean, and, and there's a lot more that we can do. Uh, but I think so. We, the way that we're using digital twin and expect to use it more and more is uh, digital twins of um, manufacturing assets for predictive maintenance, for example. But there's a whole world behind o of scaling digital twin technologies to complete plants, you know, manufacturing plants. Be able to uh, design and configure the manufacturing plant uh, to, to an optimum level. And all these things can be planned and uh, optimized in the digital space before you go ahead and touch any physical asset. Uh, so there's a long way to go. Now, talking about digital twins, I, I like to say that in R&D we also deal with digital twins but at a very, very micro scale with molecules. So create digital twins of molecules to, uh, um, to simulate how they would interact together so that we can formulate in a faster and uh, more effective way. Well, that sounds very innovative at the early stage. Yes, I mean, I think the concept that people have of digital twins tend to come from the industrial world. In, as an industrial asset, whether it's a jet engine or a piece of manufacturing equipment, or even in healthcare, an MRI scanner, you know, these big physical assets, complex, you need to create a digital version of it so that you can maintain and ensure that there's no, don't, no downtime and all the rest of it. We, and that is massive and it's great. But digital twin has many more connotations than that. You know, digital twins of human beings in the healthcare space, digital twins of your heart to be able to predict potential future disease, digital twins of molecules to be able to create formulations in ways that it would take you tens, if not hundreds of years in the physical lab, but you can do that with computational models because you have simulated the properties of those molecules. So how would Unilever deal with something like simulations of a heart? Where does that fit in the organization? <laughs> so that, that would not be part of Unilever's <laughs> scope, but I mentioned that because I used to work for another company in the health tech space, and we would be looking at creating digital twins of organs, which are complex systems, 
you know, uh, uh, have a, a multi-layered attributes to that. Uh, and then once you have a good understanding of the different organs of your body, you can create a meta system, which is your body because it's all interrelated. I mean, that's a bit of a North Star, but once you have a digital twin of yourself, then the, the, the idea of optimizing it for best performance, for best um, quality of life as you grow up, to be able to diagnose in a predictive way certain things and then being able to intervene at an earlier stage, that's something that the healthcare industry is very keen on. And I'm interested in, just because I, I worked in that industry, I come from a bit of an, I mean now in a bit of an adjacent industry, but everything that has to do with uh, health and well-being, something that I strongly relate to. CVS Health, we had on here earlier today. Oh, okay. They're, they're actually looking at the same thing you just described. Yeah. Yep. Oh. So is the market going faster, slower, or the same speed these days post-COVID? You mean from a technology creation or technology adoption perspective? Uh, for, for both. Okay. So, uh, I think COVID has been, uh, I think it has been a, um, a big digital transformation accelerator for when it comes to companies adopting new technologies uh, because there was no other option and people stopped going to the office. So you had to use uh, digital labs in our case, being able to access uh, models, digital tools, data from your home uh, in a collaborative way with other people in other parts of the world that were still at home mm -hmm. and be able to uh, bring in a certain element of business continuity to the things that you did. So I think it was uh, it served well the purpose of accelerating adoption uh, and we continue to use that momentum uh, because it, it basically served us to prove in, to ourselves the value of these technologies. So far, you know, it was not that it was negotiable, but people didn't have necessarily an urgency to embrace these tools. Now, when you don't have any other option, you start, you try out, it works, you start trusting them, and then suddenly you've changed forever the way that you operate within the company. So we're basically building on that, the next iteration of our digital transformation. Hopefully not with another COVID, but uh, you know, taking advantage of the situation that we all have been in. When it comes to the progress or the pace at which new technologies are coming up, yeah, I, th I think I, I see some exponentiality in the in the in in new innovations. Uh, but what I believe is really groundbreaking is not just anyone individually. So we talk. I will talk tomorrow about a little bit about quantum computing, about foundational AI, about hyper automation, about Web3 metaverse. So each of them individually have a role to play at slightly different time frames, but it's all these things combined. When you, th when you think about quantum and foundation AI models, you know, generic intelligence together with quantum, well, you know, that can completely re revolutionize how, how companies innovate, how companies do science. If you add to that a certain element of hyper automation, everything that can be automated would be automated and more and more consumer engagement models happening digitally, possibly in the metaverse at some point, then the whole spectrum of how you engage with consumers, how you co-create with consumers and with other partners is going to be, I think it's going to radically change. It's not going to happen in the, in, the, in, the, in the space of one or two years, but we'll see big, big uh, shifting, you know, uh, things in the next, uh, in the four to eight year window. I'm so sure. are we in basically a transition period of digital transformation right now where it's, we haven't hit the big digital transformation, we're just kind of at the baby steps of it? Yeah, I think uh, digital transformation in general, but certainly in our company, it, it moves in waves. So the, the, the trend is uh, overall towards high levels of maturity, but there's a wave, there's some stability and some period that you need, any kind of company needs to assimilate and digest. And then there's another wave that is typically uh, activated by access to technology, but also by an understanding of employees that this is the better way of doing things. So it moves in waves, in my view, uh, two to three year waves, basically. Yeah. So a year from now, you know I'm going to ask this, a year from now, what will we be talking about? So a year from now, uh, I would hope that we'll already start executing on some early use cases on quantum, uh, that we start understanding it better, and therefore understanding better how we should prepare ourselves for it. A, a year from now, I would expect that a lot of um, uh, uh, R&D activities are fairly uh, virtual. 
Not entirely, but supported by AI for decision making and a lot of AI embedded in the things that we do. But also a less siloed uh, way of managing data as well. So what happens in large organizations is that uh, in a slightly inev inevitable way is that uh, you, you ha you've become more siloed. So you've got marketing, you've got R&D, you've got supply chain, you've got a matrix or some kind of matrix between business units and markets. And um, in order to really extract value from, from data and digital and all the things that we've talked about, you need to free up data from siloed systems. So my expectation is that a year from now, we'll have done a lot of work at integrating systems that were originally functionally oriented or functionally optimized and start optimizing much more horizontally because innovation is a constant flow of activity, data and decisions that cut horizontally the entire organization. And that's where we want to go. Well, I look forward to that a year from now. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. Pleasure.